Hi, I'm Zeke with the Eastside Church of Christ in Baytown, Texas. Thanks for joining us today as we consider a lesson from God's Word. We're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 2 to begin with. We'll go to some other places. Father's Day is rapidly coming upon us. It's important for us to consider the, the men in our lives, not just the fathers, but men and what men ought to be. In 2 Kings chapter 2, uh, it says in verse 1 that King David's time to die was drawing near. And so he has his son Solomon, the one who's going to take over the kingdom, come to him. And we find some of David's final words in verse 2. He tells his son, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Paul also said much the same thing to the Christians in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 16, Paul said, Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. So, what did it mean when Paul told the Corinthians to act like men? What did it mean when David told his own son Solomon to prove yourself a man? I mean, what is a real man? Maybe it's a far cry from what the world thinks a real man is. A real man is not just someone who can father a child. Any, any man can do that. Maybe it's not even the macho man that we're, that we're programmed to think uh, really is a real man, the kind of Marlboro man kind of guy. Uh, a lot of people think that a real man is somebody who's so, so emotionally sensitive he's almost effeminate. Maybe it's a mix of both. David gives us a pretty good idea of what a real man is. In fact, in his words as we continue in 2 Kings chapter 2, in verse 3, he says, Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in His ways, to keep His statutes, His commandments, His ordinances, and His testimonies, according to what is written in the law of Moses, so that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn. David seems to imply, as he tells his son, to prove yourself a man, that a real man is somebody who follows God's lead. Bill, being a real man, according to God's will, is going to enable us to be better fathers, yes, but also to be better husbands, friends, workers. So let's spend the next few minutes exploring what it means to be a real man God's way. I'm going to say that a real man is going to understand his need to grow up. A real man matures. Too many men have grown older, but not wiser or more mature. In fact, I remember going back to my hometown years after I had moved away and saw fellows in their, their 40s and even 50s that I went to high school with still acting like they were in high school, still dragging up and down the same main street that we used to ride up and down when we were kids, looking for the same excitement or pleasure that they did when we were kids. I think there's more to life than that. A real man is going to understand his need to grow up, to mature. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11, Paul said, When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Now, Paul isn't speaking necessarily of a man's need to grow up, but he does say something very important. There's a time to be a child, and there's a time to put those childish things away, to grow up. In fact, later on in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20, Paul told the Corinthians, Do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. And so a mature man is going to understand his need to grow up, especially a man of God. In Hebrews chapter 5, in Hebrews chapter 5, we're going to make a hard right over to the New Testament. And we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5 reminds us of the need to grow spiritually. We all grow physically, but we need to pay attention to that most important part of who we are. In, Ephes in, in Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, the Hebrew writer says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you've come to need milk and not solid food. In verse 14, he says, 
solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So there's a lot there that it tells us about what a mature man becomes. He's going to realize the need to, just as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, to put away childish things, to seize his responsibilities and his obligations to grow, to grow wiser, to grow more mature in every way. And so the Hebrew writer tells his audience in chapter 6 in verse 1, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now, obviously, the Hebrew writer is scolding his, his readers for their unwillingness to, to go further, to progress. But isn't that what maturity is all about? It's about recognizing the need to go on. So a real man is going to prove himself to be mature. Not only that, but a real man is also going to understand the value of his family. Beginning with his wife, he's going to realize the value of his wife. In Genesis chapter 2, in verse 18, when the woman was brought to man, when Eve was brought to Adam, he knew immediately that she was the one for him. She was so unlike all the other creatures that God had created. And he said, now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken from man. He knew that she was the one who was best suited for him. And so should men today. Ephesians 5 and verse 28 says simply, Husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. There isn't a person around who doesn't take care of his body, who doesn't love his body. No matter how out of shape it is, he still has concern for it and wants to treat it well. Well, how much more should we treat that one well who originated from the very side of man? Fathers, I'm going to tell you something. How you treat your wife is going to impact your children, whether they're boys or girls. Your sons are going to form impressions about marriage and how men should treat women by how you treat your wife. If you display affection and respect for her, especially in front of him, then you're going to help to show him that love is needed in a relationship. And you're going to show him how to treat the woman that will someday be his wife. Daughters are learning something from you, fathers. Your daughter's future choice of a husband is deeply influenced by how you treat your wife. If she feels that you and your wife are are, are close to each other, if she appreciates the way that you treat your wife, she's likely to select a mate who's going to be like you. She's going to want somebody who's going to treat her like you treat her mother. Marriage, I think, when we, when we model it rightly for our young people, becomes an attractive goal for their adult life. But it's not just that a man values his wife. He understands the need to nurture his children. I'm going to turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul the Apostle writes about all kinds of of family relationships, and he touches on each one. But notice what he says about fathers and children. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, he says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, you can show them the ways of the world, and then you can take your chances whether or not they're going to turn out right. But, chances are, if you teach them right, right away, they'll grow up to be a lot better humans. The kind of person that you want them to be. In Colossians chapter 3, in Colossians 3, and in verse 21, there Paul says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children, so that they'll not lose heart. I think this all is kind of brought up in what the proverb writer says in Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and even when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Now, part of what this means, I think, is that you're going to train them up in, in the, the kind of aptitude that they have. You're going to give them lessons that are, that are 
that are focused on who they are and who, who you want them to be. You're going to help them to, to seize those lessons. You're going to do whatever it takes instead of just barking orders at them to really grow themselves. You're going to help them in every way that you can. I saw a neat illustration of this in a poem. Let me read it to you. One man wrote, A little one's feet needs big feet to guide them every day. Short little legs need longer legs to help them not to stray. Small little hands need stronger hands that teach them work and play. Young little knees need bended knees to show them how to pray. Cute little mouths need wiser mouths in learning what to say. And precious little hearts need pure hearts, teaching them Christ's loving way. I think that says a lot. Children of all ages need the wise guidance and influence of a good father. Finally, not finally, but next, let's realize that a, a, a real man realizes that he can be an influence to those around him. And he knows that his influence can work for either good or bad. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says that bad company corrupts good morals. And that is definitely true. But it can also work the other way around. Proverbs 27.17 says that iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And so someone who recognized already their need for maturity and for wisdom is going to be able to, to show and to model that in his life in such a way that others are going to see it. And they're going to be impacted by that. They're going to let that influence their own thinking, their own, their own activity, their own, their own conduct in the world. A real man is somebody who recognizes this. But also, as he considers his influence to those who were closest to him, a real man is going to understand also that he can be a real friend. And sometimes that means saying difficult things that need to be said. Proverbs 27 verses 5 through 6 say this, Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Now you can be a fake friend, and you can build people up all day long in their error and let them think that they're doing okay, or you can be a real friend, somebody who's really concerned about how they are as people. And you can say the difficult things. It's not easy, but that's what real friends do. Because a real man is a man of integrity. Integrity is rooted in trustworthiness. Being truthful. And certainly that ought to be the, the, the hallmark of somebody who walks with God. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says that it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. Now Paul is talking about the fact that he and his fellow apostles are stewards. They are administrators of those things that were given to them by God to disseminate to others. But fathers, you're an administrator also. You're a steward of the responsibilities that God has given to you to exercise within your framework of influence, whether it's in the home with your family, whether it's at your place of business, whether it's with your friends. You've got to be found trustworthy with what God has entrusted to you. Proverbs 20 says this in verse 6, Many a man proclaims his own loyalty, but who can find a faithful man? Now, that's a good question. The proverb writer wrote that nearly 3,000 years ago, and we could ask the same question today. Everybody thinks that they're doing great, but where can you really find a real man, a man of integrity, a faithful, trustworthy man? Well, I know where to start looking to find the traits of one. In Psalm 15, I'm going to Psalm 15. Psalm 15 asks an important question, and then it, it answers that question for us. In Psalm 15, look with me beginning in verse 1. The psalmist asks, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those are the questions. Now he'll answer them. He who speaks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart, he does not slander with his tongue nor does evil to his neighbor, nor take up a reproach against his friend in whose eyes a reprobate is despised. But he who honors those who fears the Lord, he swears to his own hurt, 
and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. I want you to take a look, especially in verse 4. It says that one who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. How many promises have you made, fellas? And then later on found out that mm, you're not going to come out on the winning end and you try to weasel out of those promises. It takes a real man to keep his word even when circumstances aren't favorable to him. Even when circumstances make it difficult to keep his word. Because when someone keeps his word, even when it costs him something, that's a sure sign of integrity. Somebody said, there's no better test for a man's ultimate integrity than, when his, than, than his own behavior when he's proven wrong. That brings me to my next point. A real man is somebody whose integrity shows him to have self-control. A man, even when he's tempted, knows the value of restraint. That's why sometimes there are such internal struggles that are going on when somebody is tempted with something. They know that it's wrong, and yet they're tempted. Well, what do they do? Do they give in to that? Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In 1 Corinthians 9, begin with me in verse... Oh, let's begin in verse 24. 1 Corinthians 9, begin in verse 24. The apostle says, Do you know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul tells us here, as he gives us an allusion to the athletes of his time, that they understood the importance of conditioning. They knew that they were running within a, 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 a set of parameters where they could compete lawfully and hopefully win the prize. And he says they've got to exercise a certain amount of self-control. They've got to recognize that all the training that they put in, they're going to have to be strategic about how they use that. They're going to have to exercise self-discipline and diligence. Now, I want to tell you, the Christian life is not an easy one. If you've tried to live it for any length of time, you know that. And so we can't just wander slackly into the kingdom of heaven. We carry us a body, we carry with us a body that is far too prone to evil, to, to pleasure, to laziness sometimes, the spiritual laziness, to lust, to envy. Now, if a great apostle like the Apostle Paul felt himself bound to exercise self-control, to keep his body under subjection, well then, how can we say that we don't? Self-control is one of the least desirable, one of the, but one of the most difficult personal traits to master, but it is the most necessary. So, a real man is going to master his body instead of letting his body master him. In Romans chapter 6, in Romans 6, Paul the Apostle says, beginning in verse 12, Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And we'll stop there. Paul the Apostle hits, hits the nail right on the head when he tells us that we get to make the choice. We get to present our own bodies, not to sin, but to, but to God. And so we're going to have to take the initiative and make sure that when those things come upon us to tempt us, that we refuse those things. Will it be easy? Again, no. But anything worthwhile usually is not. Just keep asking yourself, is this the right thing to do? And you'll answer that question. 
But it's not just his body that he masters. He masters his tongue as well. In James chapter 3, I'm going to make a right to the little book of James. James chapter 3, right after Hebrews. In James 3 and in verse 2, James says, We all stumble in many ways. I mean, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body as well. Now, I don't know about you, but I've not always been the master of my words that I ought to have been. In fact, one of the most uh, memorable quotes that I've ever heard was on a poster of one of my elementary school classrooms. My teacher had put it there. It goes like this. The quote is, I am master of my unspoken word and yet slave to those which should have remained unspoken. I'm slave to things that I never should have said. But I am master of those things that I haven't said yet, and I can choose when and what to say. In verse 10 of James chapter 3, he says, From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. We've all heard of someone being two-faced, and usually it's because of what they say. They'll say one thing in one setting and something completely opposite in another setting. Paul is, is telling us here, be consistent in your character with what you say. And you can be. The man of God ought to be. He should be. Also, consider that a man must also master his temper. Proverbs 19 verse 11 says this, A man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. I don't know how many men I've seen. I can't tell you how many times I've been that man that blows up at something that really is inconsequential. But yet, for whatever reason, things have gotten to me that day, and I just blow up. Have you done that? The Scripture reminds us that to overlook a transgression, to overlook an offense, is glory to the man. Why? Because it shows that he's got control of his emotions. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, verse 29, He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is quick-tempered exalts folly. And people can see what a fool you are when you just blow up at things that you could have controlled your temper at. Proverbs 15, verse 18 says that a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger calms a dispute. And I've seen that at work so many times. I have seen that that, that proverb being put to use in such wise ways when a situation that could have quickly escalated out of control was tamped down by the wise, calm, soothing words of a mature man, a real man. James says in James 1, in, chapter, in James chapter 1 and verse 19, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. That doesn't mean that the righteous man or the real man doesn't get angry. He does get angry. But yet, like Ephesians 4.26 says, he gets angry but doesn't sin. And that takes real strength. Again, consider the Proverbs. This time, Proverbs 16, verse 32 says, He, is slow. he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit is than he who captures a city. All of this just tells us that a real man is going to really take inventory of himself. He's going to examine himself honestly. And he's going to realize that he's not above criticism or, or rebuke. In ancient Greece, I understand that it was customary for peddlers to walk the streets with their wares and cry out, What do you lack? What do you lack? And of course, the idea was to let people know that not only were they in the vicinity, but those people could look at themselves and look at their households and ask them, okay, what am I missing? What do I, what do I need? Maybe it could arouse curiosity about whatever the, the peddler was selling. And if something was lacked and needed, well, they could buy it from him. I think an honest man is going to ask himself that. What do I lack? Where do I lack it? He's going to take an honest inventory of himself. Just like Paul the Apostle says that we all should. In 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, Paul says, 
to test yourselves, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. He might as well have been saying what David said, prove yourself a man. Because ultimately, the real man knows that it is God who examines him. It is God who delves the deepest. And it is God who ultimately ferrets out the truth about who he is. Psalm 26 verse 2 says, Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. In short, what does it mean to prove yourself a man? Well, it means, like David said, you're going to look to God's way for everything. You're going to follow His commandments. You're going to do what He says. You're going to make sure that anyone within your sphere of influence sees that you are a real man. I hope you are a real man, fellas, if you're listening. Ladies, if you have a real man like this in your life, I hope you appreciate him. And for those of us, like me, who fall far too often, far too short, we can know that there's an upward path. God provides it for us. Let's take it. Thanks for being with us today. God bless you.